Dear friends, welcome to SEM master class. For all endoscopic surgeons, for the next 5 modules, I am going to teach you how to do an ERCP because I am sure having got the idea of how to navigate with upper G endoscopy, colonoscopy, various basic therapeutic endoscopic procedures. Now, you will be very keen to see whether I can do an ERCP. So, this particular 5 modules which would roughly take about 5 hours of your time will give you all the tips and tricks you need before you go on to the theatre, watch somebody like me doing a procedure and observe them carefully and get some cases done under supervision and become a master of ERCP. It is a learning curve, we need to climb, but for the foundation I am here for you to get to some idea. Okay. So, I am going to give you 7 key steps for success. Whenever you come for any training for that matter, let it be ERCP or colonoscopy, not only you learn the technique, understand the technology, but also you have to develop a team. So, it is a teamwork. So, how are you going to get your team also ready? So, these are the basic ERCP what I call a prerequisites. So, I am going to tell you the out of the 7 step, the key important thing for any surgeon for that matter, for a good surgeon or a good endoscopist is to have a clear understanding of what he is doing, the anatomy and pathology. Coming to the anatomy as you can see here, that is whenever you are thinking about exploring the hepatopancreatic biliary system, you have to understand the extra hepatic biliary tree starting from the gallbladder and how the bile is draining through the bile duct, the right and left hepatic duct, common hepatic duct into the duodenum in the second part, where it is joined by the pancreatic duct at the ampulla of beta as you can see here. Okay. So, but what is more important is this busy area, it is just like the neighbors of our country like China, Pakistan, Bangladesh are all. So, you are having something like an hostile neighbors like a pancreas is very close to various vital structures, vascular structures. So, uh, open surgery has been a daunting task, ERCP also cannot be taken lightly. So, you have to understand all these things, then only you will be able to understand the consequences of a problem getting complicated because of ERCP not properly done by you. So, you have to get the foundation right. So, get the ample anatomy of the ampulla because when I say ampulla beta, the bile duct joins with the pancreatic duct, opens at the major papilla that is sphincter body in the medial wall of the second part of duodenum, which when you pass an upper G endoscopy, you might have seen at the 60 centimeter level in the shortest root. But you have to say, understand in addition to the minor papilla, there is a major papilla and the minor papilla is the one which is about 2 centimeter above the major papilla, wherein Normally, there is no issue, but in a people with pancreas division, they will have that as a main drainage through the dorsal duct. But let us concentrate more on the, the three dimensional anatomy of the ampulla. Here is a picture as you can see here, the sphincter of body as you can see here. So, where we normally see it has only one circular fibers that is sphincter papillae, but you need to imagine the sphincter papillae extends onto the, the bile duct okay, as a sphincter cholidocus and a pancreatic duct that is sphincter pancreaticus. So, when we do a sphincterotomy, you need to show how far I can go and what angle in order to divide only the bile duct or only the pancreatic duct. Is it going to be 10 o'clock or a 2 o'clock? So, all these things as you can see here in a smaller one, how the drainage, the green duct and the brown ducts that is a bile and a pancreatic juice, how the common channel, how the major duct opens or major papilla, everything you need to have a crystal clear idea before you venture into ERCP. And also anatomy is known for variation. What is most important for you and also for me is the S shaped course of bile duct you need to understand clearly. If you carefully see the first picture is very very important where you see the when the pancreatic duct joins with the bile duct it comes with a very short major I mean duct common channel into the major papilla. But what is equally important is the bile duct the last 
2 cm of the bile duct is having a tortuous course. So, that tortuous sigmoid course like a sigmoid colon you know how to straighten like that you need to straighten in order to succeed. So, the success of ERCP is how you are able to understand the S shaped course of the bile duct and how you are able to straighten it because occasionally as you can see in the third picture the channel may be very long common channel sometimes you will be surprised there would not be any common channel at all like here for example, you have two different channels the pancreatic duct bile duct separately opens very rare, but if it happens always almost always the bile duct opens above and to the left of the pancreatic duct that is around 10 o'clock position whereas, the pancreatic duct will be more or less at 5 o'clock position little low down. So, pancreatic duct below bile duct above that is imagination as far as the ampulla is concerned ok. As I said like an ulcer I mean ulcer anywhere in our body you know as a surgeon how to describe. Similarly, here whenever you see an ampulla for example, first study the ampulla do not just go into I want to cannulate first from a distance try to observe see the site of the ampulla whether it is a normal shape of the ampulla and how it is going to be easy cannulation or a difficult cannulation for example, what do you think see for example, ampulla beta is easy to identify I will tell you how, but it is a variable like as you can see here it will be just like a nipple or it may be having an infundibulum as a second picture or the third one which is a tricky one or you can see there is a large periampullary diverticulum in which it sometimes it will be on the right side sometime on the other side it will be draining sometime it will be right in the middle that will make you really challenging to cannulate. So, this is all the thing periampullary diverticulum is more or less like a norm than an exception and the last one you should realize this one see for example, what you are observing this picture as you can see here can you see under understand here I am just showing a picture where there is a round worm trying to cannulate. So, worm is going there nicely palpate and able to enter and cannulate that is the best cannulator without they doing any damage and it goes into the bile duct. So, similarly we should go in find the orifice that is a bile biliary orifice selectively cannulate like ankylostoma or the round worm ok. Coming to the ampulla more about it how you describe an ampulla if you just watch me it is something like my tie see see the picture on the top I have drawn a tie. So, there are multiple horizontal folds of mucosa you know valvuli circumventis condimentis you see circular folds of mucosa in the second part and this is the only vertical fold you would see in the medial wall as you can see in the first picture here and it will be what we call a frenulum and it will at the top there will be small front with a different color especially with the narrow band imaging you will be able to see that is the, the papilla the papillary opening it is a common channel opening rarely only you have a two different opening and above that you will have something like a bulge not in all people that is called infantibulum and the, the whole thing sometimes will be covered by something like a hood like a prefusial skin. So, all these things you need to appreciate as I said ampulla comes in various shapes as you can see here all these three it can be just a nipple little bulge what is easy for you is whenever you have a what we call a large infantibulum because infantibulum allows you to understand the course and it will allow also makes it easy for at least the beginners to do what we call a needle knife sphincterotomy. So, understand it fully before you address the problem. I told you already that is the importance of the embryology, the essential embryology for all of us. For example, here is a diagrammatic representation here as you can see here the two things this is what is you normally see normally and that is the abnormal one. So, let me see this one wherein the pancreas develops from dorsal and ventral bud. So, what you have is a duct of virsang the smaller duct going into the main that is it is converging onto the bile duct joining is a common channel. Whereas, the dorsal area it goes into what we call the duct of Santorini which is draining into the minor papilla, but sometime the duct of Santorini from the dorsal duct will become the major drainage and sometimes it can separately drain like this ok. So, that only you can see here 
a small portion of the unsnared process and head only will be drained by the major papilla. So, this is an area like a minor papillotomy or you need to identify in this particular case where the minor papilla, where you find the minor papilla, minor first, major next that is the concept. What do you mean by minor first, major sixth? The minor is about 2 centimeter above. So, you see the minor on your way, then only you will start seeing the major and the minor will be hidden between two horizontal folds whereas major will be top of a only vertical fold on the medial wall. So, these are all the few fundamental truths that will be there useful for you for rest of your life. Coming to the next one pathology for any pathology for that matter be it in liver, bile duct, pancreas you need to understand is it congenital, infective, inflammatory, traumatic, iatrogenic or neoplastic. For example, if you have a patient he may be a cholidocal cyst or it could be a, a case of a, a pancreatic problem like a pancreatic division. They are all congenital. Infective problems also can happen like hydatid cyst or traumatic post lab colibiliary stricture. So, like that you need to understand them. Once you know the pathology or pathogenesis, it is easy. So, always work on the basics, get the basics right before we go into the launch pad. Okay. Let me go into the next step a good endoscopic experience. If you have already done an endoscopic, you should ideally should have done in my opinion, honest opinion, 1000 cases of upper G endoscopy, 200 to 300 cases of colonoscopy, done at least about 50 to 100 cases of dilatation or injection sclero, all those things before you go and even buy an ERCP or get to know. So, do not launch after doing 100 cases of I mean endoscopy I want to do because it is now 26th year of me doing ERCP still I am learning. So, it is needing a very good foundation to learn this. So, let me take you to the basics here back to the basics what I call what do you mean by back? I am sure if you have done the IAGS program like EFAGS, FOG, which are the both basic and advanced endoscopy course specially meant for you people like a surgeon you would have seen all these slides repeatedly. But what I say is it is like starting a plane before you start the plane what the pilot say he actually do a drill what we call a cockpit drill because there is no point in checking your equipment while you are middle of doing something. So, this is as simple as that. So, pre ERCP ritual needs you just you check the scope, check the processor, suction, air flow everything is working. Okay, then only under all the accessories you tell the staff this particular patient needs ERCP sphincterotomy. Do you have a sphincterotome? If I do not, if I am not able to candelate, I may need a needle knife. And if this is going to be difficult, I need a long nose sphincterotome. I have both Olympus one, Boston Scientific. Which one you want? Keep them both like that. As many as accessories, you always have the thought process running you always keep communicating with your staff nurse because you, your assistant is going to be the one who is going to make a difference it is going to be easy or a difficult ERCP. So, that is a cockpit drill. Once you have done the drill then you go into the next important key element in what way an upper G endoscopy is different from an ERCP apart from it is a side viewing duodenoscopy as you can see here in this picture the lens and objective lens here shown here they are all on the side. So, you have a very blend in the tip, it is easy to actually intubate or the cricopharynx. But what is most important is the silver area here, for example, here what you see is a elevator that is controlled by a small knob next to the wheels. So, your non dominant hand will hold the control head in which you will find the elevator. By successfully manipulating the elevator, you can control that knob. So, that will drive the equipment into the ampulla selectively. Let me just show you what I mean here. You watch carefully in this particular picture. Okay. For example, in order to enter the bile duct here, I am just putting the elevator down. So, it pushes the instrument in to the bile duct. Whereas, if you want to enter the pancreatic duct, elevator not that much, you just keep it little horizontal. So, it goes in. So, more horizontally it will go into the pancreatic duct, more vertical course is a bile duct and also the direction also matters because they are like north and south pole. So, you need to know the elevator and also your positions are very very important. I will tell you in a minute regarding the position. 
before we venture into the procedure the next important thing is check the patient because you have done the cockpit drill instruments are okay but is the patient okay whether he needs one uh, ARCP because ERCP is not a simple procedure life threatening complications do occur unless you do it for proper indication you end up having a lot of trouble so know the indication make sure the patient has a no problem with the clotting like INR is done it is less than 1.3 or 1.4 patient drug history comorbidity everything you do but what is the most important thing apart from these things informed consent an informed consent is a very important valuable not only a legal document it ensures the confidence of the patient and their attenders here is a component of informed consent that is the content of disclosure if the patient is knowledgeable and in the age group where they can give a competent voluntary consent form make sure you explain them why an ERCP is necessary for this patient or for you and how it is done you can tell I will bring the anesthetist he will give you anesthesia you will feel full sleep then I will pass the scope I will enter see the inside intestine and get into the ampulla and see any stone if there is a stone I remove it and if necessary I will put a little plastic tube and that will, that will stay for two or three weeks if you have stones because you have a stone also in the gallbladder two or three days or two uh, five days time once the, all the liver function tests are going to be normal I may have to do you a lap coli and after that I may bring you back again to remove the stent so it is a process all the process will be addressed there and then then you tell them the whole sequence because patients have a lot of questions you give them an information leaflet explaining everything then tell them and I am sure they should be open to questions they will ask you about the, the benefits what will doctor I have ERC be done I do not want a lab coli like that they will ask all sorts of questions you have a very clear statement and all these are the you give the best standard of care possible at your setup and also you be open to the potential risks about the pancreatitis very rare problem of uh, getting admitted for a few days more because of some complications like perforation or bleeding even though however uncommon they are you have to at least one complication you have to explain it is like in a case of thyroid you will be penalized if you do not tell a patient that you are having a however small there is a risk of recurrent laryngeal now injury and uh, hoarseness of voice. Similarly here a post ERCP pancreatitis is a well accepted complication about 5 to 8 percent you have to tell in the informed consent. Bleeding perforation you can bring in in the consent form or information leaflet you need not explain in detail because other press the panic button unnecessarily. So get that all done that is why I call WHO why how and what is the outcome of you. So if you do that that is a comprehensive ins then you obviously if you have learned the trick of the trade by various surgeons across the country who are passionate teachers for this technique get a sound technique when I say ampidextrous it is not only for a laparoscopic surgeon but also for endoscopic surgeon left hand control right hand you just control the shaft so that you can go torquing the scope and also your body movement for example if I am standing here I am looking at the monitor like I am looking at you now so slowly if I turn to my right then that way you are able to torque your body not only the torque the tip of the scope it will stay inside the duodenum how you are successfully able to stay in the duodenum for even hours together it is because of your body movement watch me how I am looking I am not looking at the patient I am looking at the monitor because I am talking my body to the right side I turn to the right looking at the endoscopy tower so this is the way you need to do so you have to see the movement at the tip of the scope where exactly it depends upon not only the wheel but also the hand and also your body and the fourth one is about the elevator so everything takes the control so you understand everything understand the ergonomics this is all fundamental I am sure you know this talking to the clockwise talk as it is given here it is going to turn the scope to the right the red color and anti-clockwise it is going to turn to the left side so these are all things you know already but 
you have to understand the navigation is by using all this in a various but out of them the most important thing is your body movement okay to the right next fundamental truth i am sure you all know by this time is every monitor whenever you see be it in your own hospital or even in a conference where the the big screen you treat it like a in the endoscopy view monitor like a clock where they are showing the surgeon is showing the lesion is it towards 10 3 like that for example when we see the pylorus when we enter into the d1 for example if the side wings go the pylorus will be sun setting position that is it should be around 6 o'clock position then whenever we do a sphincterotomy for a bile duct it will be at a 10 o'clock position whenever i do a pancre pancreatic sphincterotomy it will be 2 o'clock position when i say that direction you will know so you try to comprehend everything keeping a clock in your mind so that's what for example here there is a ampulla as you can see and i have done a sphincterotomy the second picture as you can see more or less at 11 or 12 o'clock i have done a sphincterotomy and uh, you can see the the typical position of the ERCP in the shortest scope as you can see here okay so nicely it is shown here and also see here how it is as i said clock positions are very very critical like the diagrammatic representation here and also how the bow wire can be adjusted so nicely so we can see the first picture here for example is a typical 10 o'clock position that is sphincter biliary sphincterotomy is done off way and you can see complete near completion so how far you cut all those things we'll discuss subsequently all need to know is you have to have the finest control on the tip of all the equipments and it should be everything should be picture perfect very very important thing is the perfection okay next important thing is how you are going to learn now you are going to learn see in other words i presume by this last 10 15 minutes you know now the importance of anatomy pathology and also the sound endoscopy experience which comes after thousands of upper gi colonoscopy cases now coming to the will to learn and you are here to learn with us now so where you are now there are four stages of learning be it ercp or any procedure for that matter what our intention is to take you for example here is to stage 2 to stage 3 conscious incompetence to a conscious competence what do you mean by that for example you know that you do not know how to do an ERCP now that is why you are here or listening to me now that is a consciously you know about your incompetence about ERCP now you want to become competence of ERCP that is you so my job is to take you from stage 2 to stage 3 and your job is to persevere for several years like us to take you further to where we are now like a stage 4 that is a conscious competence unconscious competence okay learning curve do occur so very very important more you do you get better at all surgeons we know but how many cases of ERCP you need to assist observe or do if you ask me one number if you want to give me i would give probably i will revolve around 200 cases it is not only the number of cases matter how frequently you do minimum one ideally two cases per week is ideal in my opinion and you can see in this picture nicely as you do more and more cases here for example okay and by the time you reach 200 and you have gone 90 percent cannulation rate this is what we want to achieve Okay, it is like 95 percent of the time you need to reach the cecum, cecum intubation. For that you have, have to go at least 150 to 200 colonoscopy. So, it is always from 150 to 200 be it an upper G endoscopy, colonoscopy, even ERCP. So, that number you have to patiently wait till the time you should have somebody behind your shoulder like a mentor. Okay, because this is an interesting curve I am, I am always interested to share that is initially you come to learn without any clue what you are trying to learn okay then after even 25 cases most of us what will happen oh i can do it this is not after all difficult being a surgeon i have the hand eye coordination but that is because you have initially chose initially easy cases like biliary stones but the 26th case or 30th case will come as a challenge with a large periampulary diverticulum with a difficulty cannulation now you know okay this is going to be difficult so do not be overconfident. so you go to the mountain you go down you will have ups and downs in other words lows and highs but masterly 
activity or you become a master of the, the whole ERCP only after doing uh, all these cases less and less common cases and uh, you become confident. Now, you become masterly achieved that takes at least 200, but I would say probably 300, 400 cases. So, keep persevering, keep learning, keep watching other people how he is making it easy. There are a lot of people out there in our country abroad who make the ERCP like a piece of cake because we are used to say it is a brahmastra for all the endoscopic surgeon because there is needs a lot of things okay, in addition to the navigation skill, various gadgets, everything, foot control, eye control, everything. But now with the ESD poem, ERCP actually is become like a level 3 and you need to go higher to learn other things also. But still it is a fascinating one, it is like hernia, very how fascinating even any case you do any time. ERCP I always enjoy doing as a surgeon, as a single stage, both ERCP and lap coli in a patient where it is uh, uh, acceptable. Coming to the next important thing, you always try to move up the ladder. What do you mean by moving up the ladder? For example, when you are in level 1, you confine yourself to do basic things like I said uh, in our EFAGS courses. Whereas, when you come to the st second stage, you start getting to know what is ERCP, what about the advanced the therapeutic procedures. But what we are trying to do here is to take you even further to level 3. The level 3 is a challenge. So, the our society of endoscopy and also various associations clearly laid out what are the things as a surgeon you can do in level 1 training program, level 2 training program, level 3 where you want to do. So, you are now especially if you are watching my talk today that means you are about to go into either level 2 or you are already in level 2 trying to get into level 3. So, in that a thing, but of course, our aim is even go travel further into more specialized things like uh, get to know the US, POEM, third space endoscopy, nodes, all those things in your because I am sure there is a plenty of scope for surgeons, endoscopic surgeon because nowadays I am telling you even now endoscopy no longer optional for all of us. It is going to be an essential thing and we are have to train ourselves to do everything we do operation as a in a flexible platform through endoscopy. Those are gone where a leo myoma of stomach we used to operate, now endoscopically you can remove. So, this is the future. So, ERCP is again in the right direction you are in. So, get all the equipments ready to go. So, what are the equipments you think you need? The first thing is when you upgrade a C arm. If you are in a hospital where they have a C arm already, well and good, otherwise, or even a cath lab, even better. But ideally, you need to go and see and talk to the orthopedic surgeon who is doing it day in and out, how it works. You have to understand where the x-ray is coming. For example, here is the x-ray is produced, then it is thrown and here is the image intensified the round one, that receiver, the camera and it goes and you see it in the monitor. And you need to have the table like this table is very, very important because it admits the x-ray to pass. So, conventional surgical x-ray, I mean the table is not. So, you have to have a special table and a C arm and you need to know the scattering and how to protect yourself with the lead apron, thyroid covering, sometimes even eye cover, eye goggle. So, all those things understand the radiation as a hazard, especially if you have a lot of exposure. And the second important thing is to have some more equipments like what I just shown here, the value adding additions, irrigation pump. I am sure if you are doing a lot of therapeutic procedures like me, like a bleeding varices and things, you want to irrigate, irrigation pump will be there. COT encephalator, this is slightly different encephalator compared to the one you have for laparoscopy. So, you have one because ideally ERCP, colonoscopy, COT encephalator is important and also it is important especially when you are using the, the one energy sources. For example, in this case, I am showing you the importance of the endocut because endocut is a very, very important thing. It is going to have a precise cut, okay, you will have. Uh, let me just show in a, another a time uh, regarding the importance of the endocut. Here is a, the way it is arranged. You just see my staff is almost ready. See how the endoscopy ready, there is ERCP ready and all the things. For example, I asked her, I am going to do a biliary spectrotomy. She has my Boston scientific sphincterotome with the guide wire ready, hydrophilic guide wire and if necessary, if it fails then I need to have a needle knife 
then balloon for a fogarty balloon spring to I mean withdrawal of the stone and also a stent and all these things you have to have ready then only you can proceed. Of course, everything you need to do it systematically ideally is to go for a, a training course, but how long a course has to be for a surgeon with a busy 2 weeks, 2 days, but I think you need to go at least for a few weeks I would not say how many weeks depending upon how busy that particular unit observe at least 25 cases consecutively and try to understand and go and in the city where you are working get somebody who is already doing and ask him to be with you and let him do first few cases you assist in portions slowly you just exchange the role and start doing it that is the way I see the practical things, but for that these are all the 5 different modules which I am about to explore today for an hour and the next 4 modules I am sure once you listen then I will show you some live also or virtual live that will give you that extra confidence because now with the era of covid pandemic I think we have a difficulty of traveling getting an on site training. So, these are all the things which will compensate. So, I think when you come to a place like ours or even go to a place where they have a virtual reality simulators, various plastic mechanical stimulators, you have plenty to learn bring down or shorten the learning curve then you, you can join us for the live cases ok. Because it is not just doing a case it is few more things you need to know that is motor skill is one thing for that you need to have numbers on your side, but I can teach you the cognitive skill what are the indication contraindication, how to prepare a patient, how to interpret an ERCP like that I can tell you methodological skill if a patient admits how many days and uh, what is the system what antibiotic and uh, where all we use vitamin K like that we can methodologically we can, and how to get a consent form communication how to talk to the patient if you have any complication like that all those things you will learn not only in a book but also by lectures like this and I am sure by staying with us for a few weeks. So, that is improve your competence then I am sure there are various authorities out there like IAGS, ASI, SGEI and also the ASGE an American college SAGES there are various training board are there to assess you whether you acquired the adequate skill and they can certify you if even to give you a certification that will be medico legally also a valuable document for you. Okay. So, with that we will just next go on to the next important thing is to understand uh, one important thing whenever you try to understand any steps of a procedure you understand ERCP is not as each step ERCP for example, I have given you I will collect cannulate then do a sphincterotomy then once done bile biliary balloon sweep then dormia basket if necessary put a stand like that I put it very simply, but each particular step is actually is made up of 10 micro steps that is the way you need to understand because the end result if you want the stone to be removed like this you need to know all these things. So, steps you have to break it into micro steps try to understand how to cannulate bile duct what are the steps of selective cannulation 1, 2, 3, 4 like that you understand ok that all we are going to tell in the next class. Coming to the next thing is build your team, build your room, how are you going to do? For example, if you are having a simple endoscopic room diagnostic now it becomes like OT because ERCP is like an operation, anesthetist is going to come, he is going to give you sedation or a propofol infusion, even endotracheal intubation, CM there, diathermy, literally a theatre. So, you need to have a flow pattern, how your patient is dragged in and where you change the dress, where you do the procedure, where you wash the equipment and where you bring the patient for recovery and coming out like that. So, that should be a reception, preparation, ERCP, disinfection area, storage of all the accessories and where the patient could recover and convocation and IT and all these things have to be done ok. Let us move on to the next one. And here is and the next important thing I want to tell ERCP is a teamwork, what do you mean by TR like ERCP is 4 letter word as you can see in this picture there are 4 important persons apart from me as an endoscopist anesthetist will be there always because you do not want to shoulder the responsibility of monitoring the patient's airway or breathing. ERCP staffs 
there may be two or three but one important person is right here for example she is going to assist me okay and a radiographer there is no need for a radiologist you should be the interpreter of the biliary pancreatic injection okay as i said the person to my right here who is holding the boston scientific ercp cannula she is the one she is going to be very agile as soon as she knows how the ampulla she knows uh, what i'm going to do in other words she should be agile anticipates what i'm trying to do so you have to have the the important right hand is your staff on the right side that's what i used to say the documentation next important thing is a uh, medical legally also it's important whatever you do whether you are able to successfully do or unsuccessfully uh, uh, I mean do you need to document clearly use a software like here what we use is an ambal software very good you can take a video documentation and also you can have a print out and you have to have a way to document the whole procedure like for example this report is ours like this is what we give with the, the top portion about my our hospital the middle portion is about the patient demographics and all the procedure details micro details at least few pictures to tell exactly you have done and so these are all the minimum requirements in a report patient details why you do anesthesia ercp report in detail i'll tell you in a minute and vital signs during ercp and post op advice all those things as you can see ampulla how it is then biliary system pancreatic duct and then final impression what procedure and what is the post operative advice all these things and some pictures also as you can see here the pictures are there and the image intensifier is there and here is a sphincterotomy you have done a stent if you give the picture and go and talk to the relatives it is easy for them also to understand and nowadays i am sure you will be able to give a, even a cd with all the information necessary and you can upload this and also you can discuss like what i am doing today thanks to the technology so documentation is a key to your success of course everything depends upon you do the ercp only for the right indication when i say right indication ERCP is no longer for diagnosis you take it even though occasionally in some institution they do it for biliary dyskinesia and thing like that but for you and me it is essentially a therapeutic tool because to diagnose any pancreatic biliary problem we have other things like EUS or CT abdomen so CT MRCP endoscopic ultrasound they are all what we call a, an investigation of choice whereas ERCP is a therapy of choice so that is another important message so whenever you have for example chronic pancreatitis don't waste your time and energy trying to do an ERCP because it's at the end of the day unless the patient is having a stricture in the pancreatic duct or a stone it's mostly diagnostic you can do with with EUS or a MRCP next important thing is clear understanding indications are expanding but this is commonly I do about 100 cases means 90% of my work of course and most of you in the beginning will be for a bile duct stone a patient comes with a gall stone with a CBD stone you want to do a lap coli but before that you want to clarify and make sure you clear the bile duct so for that only the patient has come the patient may be clinically jaundiced or biochemically jaundiced so that is the first common indication the next is patient presenting with the pancreatitis you identify it is because of the bile duct biliary pancreatitis not a alcoholic that patient needs ERCB especially when they have increasing jaundice or a sepsis the third of course common indication either palliation mainly sometimes even preoperatively is biliary pancreatic cancer and a rare less common cause in my opinion is a recurrent pancreatitis pseudocyst okay I said controversial indication better we avoid in the beginning of our travel. So you need to have all these things because after all at the end of the day you want to have a relaxed night so you can sleep well for that you do not want to get into any tangle with the medical legal issues. So because you need to tell the patient relative ERCP could go wrong not only because of your poor standard of care in spite of your, our best efforts things can go wrong for various unknown reasons you tell them post ERCP pancreatitis bleeding infection risk of perforation even a probability of death in about a percentage of person is all there in the books and it is we see it day in and day out so better you explain at least the first one that is a post ERCP pancreatitis before you venture into doing the first cases because 
the one question repeatedly asked my re- residents or my people coming for any training endoscopy colonoscopy sir as a surgeon are you competent or are we re- i mean uh, legally permitted to perform okay because you are actually you have to imagine you are a surgeon competent to do all these things you are a lion but if you are everybody telling you are a sheep you are sheep don't behave like a sheep that's a picture i am trying to tell you so you need to say you should not have any doubt in your mind because as a postgraduate your syllabus allowed you to do but because of the locality like in india for example southern parts of india a lot of people learn endoscopy during the post graduation north in delhi for example i know people not even seen an endoscopy that is the way but ideally the mci or we need and the university expects you that you have a good sound knowledge it is the basic knowledge how you apply it for your endoscopy laparoscopy open surgery robo all these things all depends upon how you take it so no doubt in your mind you are legally permitted okay competency is the next thing for that you need to assess your limitation and you have to have a proof of your training like you have come to me stayed there for a few weeks or you went to some other association and spent some time in taking an exam so you have the credentials everything written credentials everything and have your log book document all the cases you do from today onwards keep a record because all the documentation record speaks volumes about you and if any presentation you are doing such cases like a rare case you where you have done a rcp then lab colleague keep them all in the record the course will respect that this is the doctor who has been following his i am in mean, a quality and he is having a good quality control self assessment so and always you say my mentor in my city or in my region is this particular surgeon so always when you have a problem he should be the go to person because the best way to avoid complication or medical legal issue you will say avoid doing rcp as simple as that but you are not going to do that but still if it is a too controversial indication as i told you sphincter body disinfection or is going to be a challenging case first 100 cases don't touch minor papillotomy or a ERCP in a patient with a bellroth to gastrectomy thing like that or if it is a too rare situation where you haven't seen even one case of intrahepatic stone being removed don't try to venture as your first case so avoid ERCP in those situations because if you get into problem you can't defend yourself okay so when in spite of all these things if you get into problem follow this alphabet be available don't run away from the problem face the problem be with the patient be approachable and when you have explained to the patient the difficulty and with a good concern good communication good documentation good compassionate care very clarity in your explanation and everything i'm sure people won't find fault and the patients will say the relative after all this doctor has done his best in spite of this happen like that and even if they go to the general practitioners or somebody they'll say oh that doctor he is reasonably good and in your case you are unlucky like that so i'm sure if you've done everything good good will prevail but in case if you get into trouble don't treat the complication yourself that's my advice expert help is always welcome and follow the patient even if the patient has to be shifted to a bigger hospital you always follow the progress of the patient if it is the same your father brother what you have done and the guidelines are there you will know what to do what not to do so that's the way i see and also it is always a good habit to become an associate with any association i am not vouching for join iags or join sgei or isg join any or all the associations or even you can become a member of all this overseas affiliation because you have come this far learning your cp that means your bread and butter is going to be your cp for long time so better you be an association even an international association that speaks volume and that will be a very good quality control for you you will be itching to learn more and more you get all the tips and tricks every time you attend a conference because i told you repeatedly from my first slide ERCP is not a destination it is a journey to be travel and it has to be enjoyed with only with a passion and perfection and perseverance and hard work as i say, always say because what peter cotton who coined the term ERCP said it is ERCP is a 10% inspiration but 90% perspiration you have to sweat in your theater and ac theater also so good luck to all of you i am sure the next four modules will be equally challenging but if you are with me i am sure to give you all the trips no hidden secrets so because there are miles to go before i sleep thank you